Europe has stood formidably against Russia's energy warfare, which has been designed to break public support uh, for Ukraine by unleashing economic pain on Europe's consumers and industry. Despite Russia's actions, this winter, Europe is prevailing. With a little bit of luck, but even more important, the great work uh, of Ditta and her colleagues, the European Commission uh, has, will get through, uh, will get through this winter. We know that next winter may be more difficult for a number, for a number of reasons, but I have no doubt that with Ditter and her colleagues <coughs> at the helm, uh, that Europe will be as well positioned as possible uh, to withstand Russia's attacks on its energy system. And Europe should not be left alone to deal with Russia's energy aggression, and global allies like the United States can and must contribute significantly uh, to helping Europe. And at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center, we've been honored to work with DITA on European energy issues. We're happy to have engaged closely with the Commission on these efforts. So DITA, I look forward uh, to hearing your insights and for the panel that will follow. Thank you very much to Ambassador Morningstar. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for the invitation and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to say a bit about the European perspective, about what happened last year, how we responded, but also, of course, to talk about the path ahead and the challenges we have for the winter 23-24. That is now uh, the focus. Before the Russian invasion into Ukraine, um, before that war and before the weaponization of energy by Russia, we were highly dependent in our energy imports on Russian fossil fuels. We imported more than or around 40% of our overall gas consumption from Russia alone, and that is in a context of imports of natural gas representing 90% of the overall consumption. We had high levels of dependency also on, oil, on Russian oil, 27%, and 46% as regards coal imports. What we saw already early in 2021, in the storage filling season 2021, was a weaponization of gas, in particular, by Russia in the run-up to the war. Um, a few words about how we have responded uh, to that. First of all, of course, there are the many packages of sanctions, the very significant sanctions we have taken uh, in cooperation with our transatlantic partner, partner uh, among others. But our primary response in the field of energy has been Repower EU, which is a plan for how to become independent from Russia in terms of our energy imports. It rests on three components, three pillars. The first pillar is reducing our consumption through energy efficiency and energy savings. The second is renewables, scaling up and accelerating our investment into renewable energy. And then the third is replacing the Russian supplies with supplies from reliable partners like the United States uh, in particular. And what you have seen over the last year is a massive surge in the import of LNG into the European Union as well as a significant infrastructure investment to make that possible, to make that changed gas inflow possible. When we set out Repower EU uh, in March last year, um, there, were quite, there was quite a lot of criticism and quite a few questions. Is it really possible? Can Europe reduce its dependence on Russia energy supplies as much as they say they want to? Yes is the answer after this year, and it has been done swifter than what anyone had in mind, essentially because the supplies have been reduced unilaterally by Russia again since before the war. In addition to Repower EU, we have given ourselves a number of instruments. We have taken action uh, uh, to respond to the emergency. Um, this includes a wide range of measures. First of all, we have put in place regulation to make sure that our gas storages are filled uh, ahead of this winter and ahead of the coming winter. We have uh, made commitments across the European Union to reduce gas consumption. Uh, we have put in place measures to make sure that there are profits from energy companies that go into compensating households and businesses, the consumers that have suffered from the very high prices. We have put in place new rules to significantly accelerate the permitting procedures for renewable. We have established a platform to ensure demand aggregation and joint purchasing across the European Union. 
and we have put in place a market correction mechanism and circuit breakers to address the financial market concerns related to our energy trade. I've been working for the EU for 30 years, a bit more than 30 years, and I have never in those three decades seen a pace of delivery like the one we have seen over this year. Uh, and I think the level of unity uh, across the European Union is another significant aspect of this. In addition, of course, uh, to the close work with partners, uh, most notably the US over this year in this crisis. And the measures we have taken have largely delivered what they had to deliver. Our gas storages uh, are currently filled at 83%. The normal at this time of year would be around 60%. The weather has been mild, but there has also been significant investments and significant efforts into making sure that gas storages um, are full. We have managed to calm markets by the demand reduction and by the additional supplies from other suppliers. So gas prices are currently at the lowest level since before the war, currently around 63 uh, at, at TTF, our benchmark. And we have diversified away from Russian uh, supplies, in primarily by importing very significant amounts of LNG, where the US has become our most important uh, supplier. And then, of course, in addition to that, we continue on our Green Deal agenda, our energy transition towards climate neutrality in 2050. Over the last year, we have installed around uh, more than 40 gigawatt um, of solar capacity uh, and 15 gigawatt of wind power just in that one year across the EU 27 countries. And we have reduced our demand. We set ourselves a target of 15%, but demand has actually been reduced 20% when it comes to natural gas. Uh, and so a very significant measure um, taken across the European Union and in agreement among the 27 member states. The crisis is clearly not over, and we have very significant challenges ahead as we prepare for the next winter, uh, and with a number of unknowns in, uh, in what needs to be done. So how do we see that and, and what are we doing there? We've got a medium-term ambition, we've got our long-term commitment to climate neutrality in 2050, and that continues to be the, the framework within which we operate also to ensure energy security uh, and affordable energy across the European Union. So we've got some big decisions ahead of us uh, in the coming months. We need to bring forward the regulatory framework on renewables, energy efficiency, energy performance of buildings, the electricity market design, and um, as well as renovation of buildings to make sure that we become more energy efficient and reduce our consumption further. And the way we have approached this in renewable energy and energy efficiency sectors is by setting ourselves clear and binding targets to make sure that the direction of travel and the investment framework uh, is clear. And then, of course, we have built significant infrastructure across the European Union to make sure that we have an internal energy market uh, that functions and that has given us security of supply across the European Union, also in what has been a challenging year. And of course, a critical element in our energy security and in our transition is our cooperation with reliable partners to make sure that we're not dependent on one sole supplier and to make sure that we transition towards uh, clean energy together with partners. We have been investing uh, in that, um, including investments, of course, since the first big crisis, the 1973 oil shock crisis, uh, but also since the first Russian disruption uh, of supplies a bit more than a decade ago. So we have given ourselves the infrastructure and the tools that are necessary, necessary to withstand that. A lot remains to be done, including to make sure that we go into next winter secure and with gas storage is full, but we are on the right pathway um, and will continue efforts there. So I do think it's fair to say we have learned from the mistakes uh, of the past. We can learn even more from this crisis, from the situation we're in now. Um, the global partnership, the transatlantic partnership, uh, is a critical learning in that context. Um, and we hope to remain um, a critical market, an energy uh, hub, and, a, um, a, and an attractive market for suppliers and for private investment um, as part of that energy transition and energy uh, security. So this was a brief overview of how we approached the challenges of last year and how we look into this coming year as part of the longer term structural changes in our energy policy and in our energy markets. So I look forward the to the discussion. Thank you very much. If our panelists can take their seats, we'll get cracking. 
And um, please over here. Thank you, Luis. Great, we're good to go. I'll um, introduce everyone and, um, and try and raise the, um, the le fa fantastic remarks from the Director General and from General Drones previously, but it is after lunch. So we wanna make sure that everyone is engaged in this conversation and what we would really like to have happen here is create a conversation where everyone um, asks questions. We have folks in the room with microphones. They're um, uh, willing at your beck and call and we're not gonna hold off till the end. If you have any question as we go, please do. Um, raise your hand and we'll call on you and see if we can and have you interact with our panelists here today. So just some quick introductions. Um, we have um, uh, over on my far left, uh, Ben Wilson, Chief Strategy and External Affairs Officer at National Grid. Um, and you, of course, you know the Director General. Um, uh, Luis Cabra, Executive Managing Director and Deputy CEO of Repsol, welcome. Um, over, to my, over to my right, Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt, Assistant Secretary of State for Energy at the Department of State, welcome. And Anatole Fagan, Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer of Chenier. Uh, great to have you all. The last person I'd like to introduce over on your left, uh, my far right, is uh, our esteemed colleague, Maxim Timchenko. He's Chief Executive Officer of DTEC, which is the largest private investor in energy in the Ukraine. And before we get into discussions of geopolitical cooperation, um, the future of energy in Europe, we thought it would be fitting first to give the floor to Maxime um, to tell us a bit about what's happening in Ukraine, um, not just over the past year and several months with a very focused set of attacks on the energy grid and infrastructure and DTEC facilities, but what's happened today. There has actually been a renewed attack today that he could tell us about. And to really um, explain a bit more about why this is so important, this, this war is of course at its heart an existential war for the future of Ukraine and its people. That's number one, the survival of Ukraine. But it's also an energy war. And DTEC is on the front lines of that conflict. And many of you here uh, are very closely involved in the energy industry for your entire careers. Um, in my recent memory, I can't remember um, a, a, an infrastructure, a grid, a tactic that um, a, a malefactor is using to try and um, uh, usurp a, uh, a populace, and DTEC is doing fantastic work to um, protect uh, the facilities that they've uh, that have been targeted by Russian drones and missiles. Your teams are scrambling to repair the damage, and many have lost their lives in the effort to keep the lights on in the Ukraine. So, Maxim, please do tell us how is the Ukraine grid, how is DTEC, how is your team holding up, and what has happened today? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to speak about Ukraine. Uh, one of the central topics of discussions is energy crisis. And energy crisis is different, different for Ukrainians and different for European people. For European people, this crisis probably reflected in household bills and, and price for electricity. Pay. For Ukrainians, it's how many hours a day they can have electricity supply or how many hours a day they spend in bomb shelters without electricity, or how they can plan the following week, uh, understanding either they go to work or stay at home because there is no electricity at companies they, they, they operate. And it's all about energy war. Energy war started by Putin, started many years ago. Started it from blackmailing, European companies, uh, European, uh, European world uh, in gas prices. In our case, the story about gas, gas prices was uh, an existential crisis for many years. And we were the first to go shouting and saying loudly that Putin is using energy as a weapon. Unfortunately, we've not been heard for many years. Finally, we all realized that this reality. But now, Putin converted this energy economic war <clears throat> into real destruction of energy infrastructure in our country. It started from October this year. Only uh, talking about our company, and we produce about 25% of electricity, and, and about 40% of electricity is transmitted through our grid. We've got uh, 
more than 170 shillings during this period of time. More than 11,000 pieces of equipment were damaged. And I'm talking only about power stations, not, not even giving you any statistics about our power grid. And literally right now, we have another, another uh, attack, part of our infrastructure. It's first time what was reported that Russians using ballistic missiles, which are quite difficult to detect by uh, air radar systems in Ukraine. That's why uh, the success rate for them can be higher. And right now, at this moment, we have several carriers of missiles in the air, and we have high chance that it will be air attack to infrastructure and several military ships in Black Sea, carriers of missiles. This is reality in Ukraine, and this is our energy crisis. And when people hear such new statistics or, or stories, of course they're asking how you, you survive for so many months, weeks. And my answer is that the formula of this survival is unity. I think for Ukraine it's one of the most important world at the moment. Unity among energy companies, and today we do not differentiate either it's private company or it's state company, we work together. We work together every day, we exchange equipment, we help each other. It's unity between energy, people, energy companies and air defense forces of Ukraine. So we work together protecting our power stations and, and our grid and substations. It's unity of Ukraine and the whole civilized world. We have all support we are getting every day. And every time I, I, I use this opportunity to say all the world's gratitude to, to all our partners, uh, United States, European Union, all other countries and companies helping us every, every day. And another, another formula of this success, that after each attack, we become stronger. Because we understand tactics of Russians, we know how to defend ourselves, we become more creative, we do everything that every attack have low impact and thanks to our air defense forces and uh, the steep learning curve <coughs> in energy industry, we are half through the winter season and I'm more, more than confident and basically that confidence was three months ago when we've been asked either we can survive this winter season. Yes, we can survive. We will survive this winter season. Putin will not plunge Ukraine into darkness. The country will not be frozen. And we will be stronger after this winter season. Stronger prepared for the next, for the next, for the next step. And basically this is, this is my, my message. Uh, five, six million people in Ukraine every day disconnected from electricity supply. But there is no chance that our spirit will change. So again, coming back to my word of unity, Ukrainians so united against Russia, against these constant attacks, we can live, we can survive, and definitely we will win. Maxim, when you took this job uh, at the beginning of DTEC, um, you probably never imagined that you would be in a position where you'd be getting daily alerts on there being 17 to 20 Russian bombers still in the air waiting to launch projectiles at your facilities, yet you manage this every day. It's a, a real testament to the hard work and the, and the vital importance of uh, energy to society. Um, the survival of DTEC's grid of the Ukrainian energy <coughs> Um, is key to uh, proving that you are not a, a people that can be um, conquered, and it's really heartening and uh, something to see. Just one final word to keep this as sober as possible. You have lost staff in this conflict, people, um, DTEC staff who have been line workers, just a word or two um, uh, about them. Um, my understanding is over 200. It's, it's the, the highest price possible 
repay for uh, for for the for the future, not only Ukraine but the whole Western world, civilized world. Uh, and I have all these statistics every day. So today we lost 177 people, employees of the tech, 4,700 4, people serving in Ukrainian army out of 6,000 people working for our company. And uh, sometimes I'm asked, what is the most difficult for you being in this war and, and leading this one of the major energy companies in Ukraine? The most difficult for me is to find the words not even any other way of motivation, to ask people to come to power station knowing that power station is target of missile attack. And that's what I call heroism. And what, that's the reason why I'm staying and working as much as I can in this company, because I'm proud to be with these people. Working power stations, going after sappers to restore power supply, we have, uh, uh, Unfortunately, the situation when, when mines are not detected and we have explosion and, and, and our electrical crews uh, and members of the crews died. This is what is happening. And this is something that uh, most the most hurting and more difficult to live with. But I don't want to change anything until we win this war. Thank you for sharing, and, um, and we really do appreciate your um, reminding us how important it is to keep this war and this conflict top of mind um, as we move forward and talk about energy and European energy, which is what we're here to discuss. But thank you very much for setting the stage on that. And, um, and we'll come back to you, if we can, in a moment, because there's a lot of innovation happening at DTEC as well in the midst of all of this, and we'd love to hear about your renewables push. So we'll come back to you on that in a moment. Um, but I'd like to go back to what the Director General was talking about a little bit earlier and um, the position that Europe finds itself in right now, um, partially due to Mother Nature and, and warm weather and fast action in unity, uh, the, the, um, their, the energy crisis in Europe has been somewhat um, limited over this winter and things are looking positive. Um, storage, new f uh, uh, floating LNG terminals are being opened. Germany has uh, uh, extended the life of its last three nuclear power plants. Mother Nature is cooperating, winter has been mild, energy prices are low, gas reserves are full. Um, fears sparked by the Nord Stream shutoff are starting to subside. Is there a risk that we become too sanguine with our good fortune and not look actively towards this coming winter, 2023-24, and how can we prevent that moving forward in our response, Director General? I think uh, that's partly my job, is to make sure that we keep our focus on the winter 23, uh, 24, that we do everything we can to prepare ourselves. Um, I think the shocks we went through uh, over 2022, and that is nothing compared to the invasion in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, we were seeing the effects in energy markets, we were seeing the effect of the weaponization of energy, so we're talking about a completely different crisis, and I want to, to be clear about that. But I think what we have been through this year has also put us at a level of alert that we know we have to be agile, we need to have to be prepared, we have to do everything we can to be ready for whatever happens. So there is a high level of awareness across the European level, of, across the European Union, of the challenges and the risks as we go into, into this uh, next year. I think in the best case scenario, our storages are above average when we finish this winter, so that when we go into the storage filling season in April, uh, there is less work to do and we're less dependent on some of the risk factors out there. Now that storage filling level depends on the weather. Uh, it also depends on our ability to continue to reduce demand and that's why we've given ourselves an obligation to do it. We have made it clear that we want to do it across the European Union. And then it depends on our ability to put in place alternative sources, to scale up the renewables fast and to continue to work with global partners. Uh, and I think that global partnership and the transatlantic partnership, once again, has been absolutely critical in our ability to address the challenges of 2022. And we look forward to continuing that engagement with global partners to make sure that we're ready for, 23, uh, for the winter 23-24. Thank you for that. And, and wanted to bring in you, Ambassador Pyatt, on this because transatlantic cooperation has been critical and key. Um, we were discussing earlier there have been some bumps along the way on other issues around the IRA and EVs, 
protectionism, but by and large, a real show of strength. How is the U.S. Uh, and transatlantic relations playing into this ability to not only solve um, this year's winter, but planning for next year? Well, first of all, I would say successfully, and it's a testament to the partnership that Dita and I are part of, which really comes from the very top of both President von der Leyen, President Biden, and, and all the efforts that have been made. But I want to come back to something really important, which Maxime said, which is the idea that Putin's weaponization of energy did not begin in February. It began years ago, and in many ways, Ukraine was <clears throat> the first victim of that. Um, in some ways, Ukraine's energy grid is today the front line of European security, which is why we have worked so hard together in the G7 with our European partners, with Japan, with others, um, in order to give the Ukrainians the resources they need to restore the integrity of their grid, to build back better, as you alluded to, Andrew. Um, I would also flag from my own return to Kyiv last month, just something that was implicit in, in Maxime's remarks, which is just, how deeply impressive the resolve and determination of the Ukrainian people is. And the, the energy workers, the civil society, the politicians, it's really quite, quite profound to see. I think as we look ahead, you know, Fred made the point in his opening remarks that we are living through um, a remarkably dynamic and challenging moment in the geopolitics of energy. And it's important to remember that Putin's invasion of Ukraine and the weaponization of energy has not just affected Europe, uh, for, and I, I, you know, having lived in the European Union in the Eurozone for the first three months of the war, I know how concerned citizens and companies and political leaders were. But look at the global south. Look at how the invasion of Ukraine and the weaponization of energy resources has disrupted global food security, has disrupted the cost of fertilizer, has disrupted the plans of governments in, in Africa, in South Asia, in East Asia, and beyond. I think in the European case, in the transatlantic case, um, Dita did a good job of charting all of the progress that has been made. I, I would just emphasize the commitment on the U.S. side to continuing that as we head into next winter and, and the years beyond. The IEA has pointed to a 30 BCM gap in global gas supplies as a result of the decoupling of, of Europe and Russia. And I think that decoupling is permanent. There is going to be no return to business as usual with Russia on issues of Europe and oil and gas, and that's a, a welcome development. Um, US LNG producers are a big part of that story. The fact that we more than doubled the supply of US LNG to, um, uh, to Europe last year is a tribute to the dynamism and the, the effectiveness of, of our producers. Um, but we also need to keep working on the energy transition together, recognizing that um, the, the surest source of energy security is a successful transition to re new and renewable sources. And I, I think to finish up, um, you alluded, Andrew, to some of the issues around the IRA. Um, I think President Biden has made clear our commitment to work through those. But I think what has been missed in some of the conversation is extraordinary opportunities that are going to open up in the United States. What happens when you put $36 billion a year over 10 years into this sector? The opportunities that's going to create for European companies to invest in wind and solar and storage and hydrogen, all of the novel technologies that are going to part, be part of the energy transition, which I expect Europe and the United States will le lead together, both because of the innovative character of our economies, but also because of the trillions of dollars of goods and services that flow across the Atlantic every year. It sounds like there's some uh, great unity there, and you're right, ins the ins inspirational story of the Ukrainian people and what we can learn from them has uh, caused us all to rally together uh, and cooperate, which is wonderful. But I'd like to take us back to an earlier period, 50 years ago, in fact, and uh, the Director General mentioned this uh, in her remarks, actually, 1973, an OPEC oil crisis. Very similar impacts, completely different conflict, nowhere near as existential, but still, um, OPEC quadrupled the price of crude, which at that point powered 60% of Europe's energy. 75% of it was coming from the Middle East, which was the cheapest so far. This crisis also created a tremendous opportunity for reform, both in energy security and in environment and efficiency. But it was missed, largely due to a lack of a coherent strategy and nation states acting in their own interests, ultimately, bilateral, bilateral deals were struck 
um, and uh, between France and UK and Saudi. Um, West Germany courted Iran rather than go through the, the whole list. Um, in fact, that were the roots, became the roots of uh, West Germany exploring pipelines to what was then the Soviet Union in order to create another secure form of gas, and here we are today. So, um, and, and I might add that Britain and Norway began deep water drilling in the North Sea um, shortly after that as part of that effort. Um, so it was actually a turn towards fossil fuels. And I wonder if we're seeing some of that um, today in what's happening with LNG, um, a, a, a transition um, source as we've been discussing earlier. And um, so I'd like to actually bring Anatole into that discussion if we could and talk a little bit about that in the LNG market. Chenier is the largest US LNG exporter. 70% of your um, molecules um, in your production came to Europe this year. Um, and uh, I think it was you who said, Europe has now been transformed from a market of last resort to a market of greatest need. Um, and LNG terminals are proliferating everywhere. Germany has, is creating them right now. And as we discussed um, earlier, at an incredibly um, record pace, it's remarkable. Are we seeing the same dynamic with LNG as we saw with fossil fuels, um, North Sea drilling um, that we saw in 1973 as history repeating itself? Thanks, Andrew, and uh, tough acts to follow all around, so I'll try to contribute a verse. Um, I am honored to be here, of course, representing Chenier. Um, Chenier came up with this model that has allowed uh, the U.S. export system to respond to this crisis. Uh, so we're very, very, very honored to, to bring that to the table. And Andrew, as, as you said correctly, it, it was our product, but that product was controlled, over 90% of that volume was controlled by our long-term customers, and, and they directed it to, to the market that, that sent the right signal. I do think that that is a key part of the solution going forward. Who knows what weather will bring, who knows what, what the supply demand will be precisely over the coming years, but that flexibility of diversity of, of destinations and diversity of suppliers from the buyer's perspective uh, will allow the responses to be much more measured and much more pragmatic. So it, early on in this crisis, there were these uh, ideas that, well, um, why don't you uh, enter into a transaction that supplies Europe for a decade and then supplies uh, emerging Asia for a decade? And, and while conceptually that's not a bad idea, practically that's uh, not feasible, but what is feasible and what we have seen in the system's response is that the majority of the commitments for uh, the U.S. product have come from intermediaries, which will take them to, to the market that, uh, that sends the right price signal. So I do think in that sense, um, you know, U U.S. will be part of that solution going forward. It does have some similarities in terms of stimulating that demand to the, uh, to the 73 crisis. It has the additional, uh, of course, tragic component uh, that Maxim spoke to earlier, that uh, the Arctic Russian uh, LNG supply, which was in our view, part of, the, uh, part of the equation for decades to come is now off the table and the world will have to rebalance, uh, rebalance without that supply node. So we, we think this is a, uh, a very elegant component. We do think that in order for it to have the type of durability and longevity that uh, our assets rely on, we're going to continue to invest in the, the improvement of the life cycle emissions profile. We think that the U.S. and Canada has tremendous uh, opportunity to do so over the coming decades, and uh, the, the contribution to, to decarbonization will be tremendous just from that, that focus on that, that supply chain. And that's what enables us to partner with uh, European buyers, buyers that put Chenier on the map initially. The, the majority of our original foundation customers when we started out are European-based companies. Un unfortunately, no one represented on this panel weren't fortunate enough to, to work with National Grid, but we did with Centrica, not with Repsol, but we do have uh, Natergy, Bedrola, other, uh, other Iberian players. So it, it will be part of the solution. We're, we'll contribute to that. We have an expansion uh, going on in Texas. We'll continue to expand our platform, we said, uh, from the current uh, additional 15 million tons, we'll, we'll add another 30, which will take us to 90 million tons, which is, uh, uh, which is what, uh, uh, slightly larger than what QE is today. And the U.S. platform overall will continue to be, to be responsive to Europe's and, and the world's need for this, uh, 
increasingly cleaner fuel. Thank you for sharing. And I want to remind uh, the audience, questions are welcome. If anyone has any, they can uh, raise their hand and be recognized, and we'll um, pass around a microphone, just as a reminder. Um, Speaking of renewal, renewables, let's bring Luis into the conversation, if we could. Um, Luis, uh, your CEO, uh, Josu John Imaz, said in November that Europe has failed its energy transition. And of course, um, what he was referring to was the um, focus on renewables up until now. But um, tell us a bit about that, what he, mean, what he meant by that, and what we can do to better accelerate the transition to renewables and what Repsol is doing in that regard. Okay, this is uh, a good start, uh, having or being uh, at the right-hand side of the Director General <laughs> of Energy of the European Commission. So let me fine-tune a little bit what our CEO said. Uh, he said that Europe has failed its energy security, and uh, we have heard about, about very, very meaningful discussion from, from, uh, from Dieter. Uh, and we might be at risk of uh, failing our energy transition if we do not take into consideration the whole picture, the energy trilemma, and uh, being sure that energy security, affordability, and decarbonization is addressed at the same time. But let me say after, after that, that that we Europeans, we can be very proud of what has been done in Europe uh, during, during this century in terms of decarbonization. Uh, we have reduced uh, our emissions more than 25%. Probably this is the continent that has done a better job on that by far. Uh, but we cannot be complacent. Uh, we, we need to take into consideration that a part, we can discuss, uh, discuss which part of this reduction has been accompanied by a reduction of the industrial capacity of Europe. We do not reach our target of having the weight of industry in our, in our GDP more than 20%. We are now far, even more far than that at the beginning of the century. So we cannot be solving our CO2 emissions by exporting emissions elsewhere because the industrial capacity that we lose is gonna be built elsewhere and maybe they are not as good as us in, uh, in reducing emissions. So, so definitely uh, this is uh, this type of provoking a discussion and say how we can together solve this energy trilemma. So this leads me to, to the second part of the question. You said how we can accelerate our transition to renewables. I would rephrase again, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, even the questions. Uh, say how we can accelerate the decarbonization of our energy mix. And this comes with not being dependent on just single options. Uh, we shouldn't depend on single options on supply, Russia. We shouldn't depend just on a single decarbonization solution to solve a huge issue, which is being climate neutral in 2050. <coughs> that's, that's why we always uh, say we can do a good job in different fronts. Uh, uh, but definitely, uh, on one side, we are very insistent that uh, policies and regulations in Europe are as open as possible with regards to the options. Let's prohibit or limit emissions of CO2 and let's promote all decarbonization options that technology puts uh, in our hands. Now we see, of course, we need a big emphasis in electricity generation, renewable electricity re generation. Repsol is there. We will be producing uh, in, in a couple of years uh, more than six gigawatts of wind, solar and hydro. Uh, in Spain, in the US, and in Chile for the time being, on the way of having uh, a production of 20 gigawatts in 2030. We were producing zero renewable electricity. We were not in that business just uh, five years ago. So, but, but also we want to see a future to our uh, industrial uh, units in, in, uh, in Iberia. We have very competitive refineries and petrochemical sites. We are convinced, and I can speak now uh, from Repsol side and also from the Association of Fuel Manufacturers in Europe, Fuels Europe that uh, I have the honor of uh, presiding uh, during these years. And we are committed to transform these two uh, renewable liquid fuels. What production we can get, we'll see. 
But if we have the right policies and the right regulations, we will exhaust the maximum capacity of renewable liquid fuels that, uh, that uh, we can produce in Europe. And, and we have some independent studies that show that we can produce more than 200 million tons of these materials uh, in, in Europe during the next uh, decades. And Repsol will be producing next year 250,000 tons a year of jet fuel coming from used cooking oils and animal fats. So this is, this is going on, and uh, we need to get most of the, uh, the regulations open the space to get the maximum of raw materials to produce these new fuels, and also to have opened the door to use these fuels everywhere, for aviation, for shipping, for road transport. And we have an interesting discussion in Europe about banning the internal combustion engine, I like to see, uh, for the time being, a small door open to say, okay, if these internal combustion engines are accompanied by carbon neutral fuels, that could be a feasible solution. We, we want to collaborate more with the European Commission on, on that front. So at the end of the day, opening the door from regulation to different options. I finalize saying, okay, this is what we ask uh, to uh, politicians. But, uh, well, what about companies? What, what we need to do? What we need to do is put in uh, our money where our mouth is. And, uh, well, Repsol, during the period 21 to 25, is going to invest 35% of our total investment is going to be in low carbon, either renewable electricity generation, low carbon fuels, hydrogens, and starting to invest in carbon capture and storage. So we were investing zero uh, just uh, five years ago in this front. We are very much committed to uh, climate neutrality. Modestly, we were the first company in the world, oil and gas company, to commit to net zero back in December 19. But we are really are putting our money uh, where, where our mouth is, and, and we are very actively collaborating or trying to collaborate with the European Commission in the uh, legislation front, and, and please find Repsol and Fuels Europe as uh, credible and loyal partners uh, in this effort. Uh, wow, you are um, uh, uh, looking at a variety of different options for uh, for production, and I look forward to one day driving a car um, powered by cooking oil and animal fat. <laughs> um, uh, ben, I'd love to uh, incorporate you now. Um, you, too, are a big proponent of re renewables at National Grid, and you have a very interesting uh, purview over both um, the UK and the Northeast of, uh, of the US, where I am a customer of uh, National Grid, I might add. Um, and I know that one of your um, go-tos um, is hydrogen. Um, is it time to step on the other gas, um, if I can make a dad pun, and you can uh, share a little bit about your thoughts on the transition? Thanks, Andrew, and great to be here. And I'd like to start by saying that the people of the United Kingdom stand with Ukraine against the aggression of Russia. Um, I'll also, I think, touch on the first gas before we talk about the other gas. And, and I echo the comments about the importance of US LNG. So our Isle of Drain LNG regas terminal, which is the largest in Europe, in 2021, 30% of the cargoes came from Russia. In 2022, 30% of the cargoes came from the US. And then actually a lot of that gas has been flowing straight through the UK and through our export pipelines to, to Europe, which have been flowing full power all year. Also our electric connectors to France, which normally import French nuclear power, have been flowing in the other direction this year. So we may not be in the EU anymore, but we are still European, and we are still a good European partner supporting the, uh, the EU. Uh, we are very excited about hydrogen, uh, particularly in the Northeast United States, supported by the Inflation Reduction Act. We think it's a very prospective way to decarbonize our gas networks in the, in the US. But green hydrogen, it's important to remember, is not a primary source of energy. It actually all comes from renewables. And so the main thing that we need to do in the UK and in Europe to get us off this uh, Russian problem is to build, build, build on the renewable side. And one consequence of the war is there is no longer an energy trilemma. Renewables will decarbonize us. They're also now in Europe by far the cheapest form of, of electricity generation. Not a little, but a lot. Um, and they contribute to energy security. So there is no trilemma. We need to build, 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 in particular from our perspective in the North Sea. 
we have 14 gigawatts of offshore wind in the North Sea. That's the second in the world after China. Um, our target for 2030 is 50 gigawatts, and the EU's target in the North Sea is 76 gigawatts. It needs to be a joint project between the UK and the EU and the North Sea, and we were very pleased to re-enter the North Sea Energy Cooperation Partnership uh, in December. It's very important that the North Sea Rim countries work together. The last point I'll make, Andrew, is uh, one that I really hope makes an impression. If we think about the dollars that we need to spend by 2050 to deliver net zero on generation, on renewable generation, we need to spend a comparable amount of dollars on grids to bring that power. And we mustn't lose sight of that. Uh, everybody loves wind in the North Sea, but we need a lot of transmission lines to bring that power to customers. So there's some hard, boring work to be done on regulatory approvals, permitting and planning permission to build those grids to bring the power to the customers not to mention in the northeast of, uh, of the U.S. as Absolutely. well at the same time, a, a political yeah. uh, minefield, I know. Yes. So an interesting um, uh, data point that you raise as we were talking about the 1973 crisis, increasing production uh, in deep sea drilling in the North Sea. Uh, Britain was the number five producer, I think, of oil at that point in time. Now the number two producer of wind. What a transition in 50 years yes. and very hopeful um, for, for us in this discussion going forward. Maxim, I'd love to come back to you and talk a bit about the future of DTEC and some of the investments that you've been making in renewables and your thinking around that. You were just mentioning to me before this discussion, before we came out here, as we were talking about the horrific situation in the Ukraine and the triumph of DTEC and the people of Ukraine, some of the projects that you've got that you've been investing in that you'd like to bring back online. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what DTEC is investing in because it's um, uh, quite interesting, your, your view and your foresight and your forward thinking. Thank you. Uh, we're investing in energy security of Europe. You know, it's, I think it's, it was very symbolic that uh, on the night when war started, Ukrainian uh, energy grid disconnected from Belarus in, in Russia. It was sort of test mode, but it's appeared that it's disconnected forever. And then Ukraine surprised the whole world with greatest support of European Union and United States when we connected to European grid on 16th of March. So now we're physically part of European grid already. And all future investments in Ukraine by the companies or by the government should be associated with the role of Ukraine in the future energy security of European Union and in green transition. And there are enormous potential in Ukraine. If you're talking about gas, we have one of the largest gas deposits in the country. And I'm more than confident that Ukraine will, will become net exporter of gas over the next one, two years' time. Even today, 30 BCM problem for European Union can be partly resolved by Ukraine. After winter season, for some months, we can start exporting gas to Europe. We have one of the largest gas storage capacities. Uh, we have one of the most developed nuclear industry. And bringing new technologies like SMR can, uh, can let us start exporting uh, clean energy to Europe. And coming to renewables, uh, we have one of the highest potential in solar and wind in the country. We have great radiation, topography, connection to the grid, and uh, we did some preliminary feasibility study that we can reach as much as 50% of renewables in our generation mix, as much as 30 gigawatt of capacity, out of which up to 15 gigawatt can be exported to European Union. And uh, what we need for that, we need to develop our interconnection and uh, cross-border capacity, and we, we worked together with our uh, European partners to increase it now, and uh, we need investors to come to Ukraine, and conditions should be created for them. As an example, for our company, uh, is already mentioned, uh, the war started for us quite a long time ago, when in 2014 we lost about 30% of our assets in Donbass and Crimea, some of generation. What was our response? We heavily invested in renewables, more than 1.2 billion euro, be and we became the, the largest uh, renewable investor in the country. Today, we lost control of all our wind, wind parks, temporary, but still half of our renewables capacity under occupation. 
What is our response? Just one month ago, we resumed construction of the largest wind farm in Ukraine. After Kherson was deoccupied and front line moved a bit for security reasons, we make this decision to keep building uh, this wind farm erect uh, turbines we have and add another so needed capacity for Ukraine. The recent talks of uh, or statements of President Zelensky about, uh, about Ukraine that we can become green hub for Europe. Yeah, and that's that's very important message. And that we need to be to build more de decentralized system. So and what is interesting is that the idea to, to build more decentralized generation from technical point was heard many years. In our case, the primary reason is not it's not that this is the most efficient way. In our case, is that it's much more difficult for Russians to get to, to hit large transformers that we have next to our nuclear station. If we have decentralized, decentralization is mostly renewables, building more renewables. So basically, this is what we are doing, and I think that uh, role of Ukraine in energy security of Europe will be one of the driving forces of recovery of Ukraine after this war. Thank you, Maxim. And um, I, I, that's a, a very uplifting thought as well as you look to diversify your sources and are getting your um, uh, wind facilities back online. Um, it was talked about earlier uh, today, um, uh, the future of Russian energy globally. Um, I, I know I would know, uh, I, I would expect your answer to this, uh, but um, Ambassador Pyatt brought this up earlier that you know, there, there is no future for Russian energy in Europe right now. What it, well, I would just love to t hear your view on this uh, 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 going forward, because in the past, as we've discussed time and again, um, the Russians have gotten back into the energy stream and flow in Europe. Um, is, this, is this final, do you think? Is this the last draw? You know, today I was quite surprised by some comments about forgiveness of Russia or Russian gas back to the market to stabilize the prices and all other ideas or talks about that how this country can be forgiven for what they've done in Ukraine and what they're doing every day. And by the way, what the recent reports come and they, they finally launch uh, uh, missiles and we just expect in a matter of hour to hours what, what pieces of infrastructure will be destroyed. As it was said, Europe learned their lessons. And this over dependence on Russia as an as a energy provider Cannot, cannot be uh, repeated. And the solution for this is to, first of all, to be self-sufficient in, in power generation, in, in power resources, and dealing with real partners, reliable partners like, like Ukraine, as an example of what, what I said. In my, my opinion, my belief, and in my morale, for the next generation, Russians should should not play any role in energy sector of European Union. We'll have to come back to you for this, Director General, just to get your thoughts on that. Would you agree? And after time and again of some shifts in European energy um, sourcing over the past um, decades, it, would you agree with Maxim that that's the final straw? I think these are really critical points. Um, and I think one of the factors that contribute to this movement that you're describing is uh, the fact that we are facing uh, several crises at the same time. We have the climate crisis that requires us to make that fundamental shift in our energy system. To the extent we use fossil fuel, we need to make sure we lower the methane emissions um, um, that are linked to, to that production. Uh, we need to make sure that we develop carbon capture uh, uh, use and storage. Um, and we have to make that very significant shift towards decarbonized sources of energy and renewable energy, first of all. So we've got the energy transformation, the energy transition, and as you have said, that is complex, but we have shown that we can decouple the carbon emissions from our economic growth. So we need to do more of that. At the same time, we are in a war in Europe. Ukraine has been attacked uh, by Russia, and that war is felt uh, on the continent. But as, uh, as you said before, it is also felt globally, because the gas that Russia has taken out of the market has not been taken out of the Europe mar European market only. It has been taken away from the global market. 70 or more billion cubic meters that would normally have been supplied by pipeline to Europe um, is no longer supplied. And because it was pipeline supplies, it has nowhere else to go. 
So it's taken out of the global market. Um, and so this double crisis that we are, that we are facing has, meant, has forced us to make some very rapid decisions to change our systems, to take a significant step into that transformation much more rapidly than what anyone had foreseen, to make swift investments into renewables, to make the overnight synchronization of our electricity system with Ukraine's. As you said, it was in test mode, it was in, in island mode. Uh, the invasion happened, and very, very quickly, we integrated Ukraine into our energy system, and since then have been working very closely with Ukraine obviously in responding to the attacks in the energy sector and together with partners to, uh, to deliver generators, transformators, all the things that are necessary there. But what I've been so impressed about, one of the things I've been impressed about in how Ukraine has, has approached this, is the ability in Ukraine to not just address the war and the crisis and defend yourselves, but at the same time to think long term and to work with that transition, work with neighbors and partners to transform the energy system through investments into renewables, through alignment with our overall energy system, our internal energy markets. So I think the changes we have seen over this last year, the significant investments, the infrastructure investments, those changes, you don't just turn them around again. It doesn't happen like that. Energy infrastructure is heavy infrastructure, uh, in, uh, capital uh, intensive. It has happened faster than what anyone thought. But the idea that one could just turn that around again is simply not has it doesn't have a it doesn't have a place in reality. So I think we're going to see the contrary. We're going to see a further acceleration of renewables, a further diversification of supplies, a further integration of Ukraine with. Europe in the energy market and more broadly, um, uh, and a further development of the global energy market that aligns with the climate crisis and with the need to decarbonize our energy systems. Um, that is a, a really great summary um, uh, of the discussion we've just had and everything that Maxim and our excellent panelists have shared. Um, and to put a fine point on it, um, Vladimir Putin, uh, megalomaniacal uh, war criminal and transformational force in the European energy system and a real catalyst for change. Strategic genius. Strategic. <laughs> so he remains a master strategist, I would agree. Um, you can find a recap of this conversation on the forum website, of course. Um, and I want to thank our panelists for an excellent discussion that was really very informative. And Maxim, Slava Yerkeni. Yeroen Slava.